go against Cheng Lin playing Mono Black Devotion. Nick Miller asked us before the round, you know, what do we want to watch? We said, yeah, you know what, we haven't seen Mono White for a while. Let's do that. And then he said, well, it looks like my Mono Black Devotion run is over for the weekend. As here it is, and of course it's 4-0. But a judge of familiar is going to start things off here for Justin. Yeah, this is a pretty spell-heavy build of Mono White Aggro. Four copies of Bray the Elements, no surprise. Three to Johnny Call of the Pride. Two to Johnny Steadfast. A Spear of Heliod. And three copies of Banishing Light. So... We've seen some lists that are incredibly threat dense, playing all the way up to 21 drops. This uh, has slightly fewer creatures and more utility out of the spells. Imposing Sovereign on turn number two. You see the Mutavault that Heilig did play that turn as well. That's pretty important. It would keep the pressure on the Mono Black Devotion deck. As Lin does draw a card, let's see what land this is going to be. It's a Swamp. And of course, it opens up but plenty of things here. Devour Flesh is going to be cast. I imagine Heilig will just sacrifice the Judge's Familiar here. Yeah. Don't want a second response because you want to gain that life, so you yeah. just just let it happen. That life could matter. Heilig will untap and draw a card. You see there's a Brave Elements in his hand. It looks like he picked up a copy of Boros Elite for the turn. I, be I believe there's also a Daring Skyjack hiding out. We'll see in just a moment. This is going to be an activation of Mutaval, so it doesn't look to be the case. It'll be an attacker for four, and then can follow up with the Boros Elite. Well, Justin over here already gets my seal of approval. Mm -hmm. He could have just played the frontline medic this turn, but against Mono Black Devotion, it's so important to get in your shots when you can with Mutaval. It almost doesn't matter what creatures you have in play. Most of them will just die. So just get in your damage while you can. Try to be as inefficient as possible. And of course, that Boros Elite is, is basically a 3-3 at this point, too, yeah. because there's a Mutaval, and of course, another attacker there, an opposing Sovereign. So, got a like this a lot here. And he still has the opportunity for this turn. You know, he could play Frontline Medic and leave up Brave the Elements. He could animate his Mutavault, attack again, hope that the Mutavault is the one targeted with the removal spell. There's a lot of ways for him to play this, and uh, that turn that he had last turn was excellent. Hero's Downfall is going to go after Imposing Sovereign. Brave the Elements is going to blow that up in a big way. And now here's an attack for three, four, five, six, seven points of damage. Lin is already down to eight, and if there's a follow-up here for High League, it gets really ugly, but, but fortunately for Lin, there's not. And this Imposing Sovereign is an issue for Chang, even though he's a removal-heavy deck. He can't play anything to block, mm -hmm. or at least he's on a turn delay. So it means he has to cast spells, because creatures are no good right now, and that plays right into the Brave of the Elements that we saw last turn. And oftentimes, you see games like this where Grey Merchant would stabilize things, or a card like Nightfall Spectre, which would be great if it were untapped, but Imposing Sovereign's text certainly playing a role in this game, making the Spectre come into play tapped. And now High Leg is going to play a land. Looks like he's going to fire Mutavault again. This is another attack here for seven. Lin is going to go down to one. And now here's a frontline medic. This is, I think, as far as the white aggro draw goes, this is how you draw it up. This is this is really good. And uh, Justin has, as far as I'm concerned, navigated this perfectly thus far. There's Grey Merchant. And of course, that will drain end gain for five. So Lin's going to go up to six. Hylix is going to go down to 16. But he is, I believe, just dead on board. Yeah, I mean, the most he can do is block three and take seven. Mm -hmm. There's also an Ajani steadfast in Justin's hand, which yeah. can complicate things further. As long as Justin doesn't overthink this. Yeah. And you can see that's what he's doing right now is, you know, he's making sure he doesn't mess anything up. Yeah. This is also fine. He didn't need to reveal that this card was in his deck because animated Mutavault would have also generated a lethal attack. Yep. But this is fine. Justin will still win the game with this attack, assuming that he just distributes counters amongst his creatures. Yeah, and that's like exactly what he's going to do. He'll minus that thing, put creatures on, put counters, excuse me, on everybody, and everybody here is going to attack. Of course, battalion triggers numerous frontline medic, making everything indestructible, and of course, Boros Elite getting a little bit bigger. And you see, Lin will pick up the cards as he cannot continue. Justin Heilig is going to win game number one here over Chang Lin. Mono White Aggro taking down Mono Black Devotion, good versus evil, to be sure. And you got to see some demonstration of the strength of something like Mono White Aggro. It's a deck we see very rarely, uh, maybe not even in the top 10 most represented decks in the room. But Chang's draw there was on the draw, Devour Flesh into Hero's Downfall, Night Vale Spectre, Grey Merchant and wasn't even close to keeping up with what Justin was doing. So uh, a demonstration of what decks like Mono White Aggro can do against Mono Black Devotion. Let's take a look at the sideboard, and you have Mono Black Devotions in front of you. So the big test in this matchup, how many copies of Freak is here, Life Bane Zombie, and Drown and Sorrow does the sector bring to the table post board. One Drown and Sorrow, three copies of Life Bane Zombie, three Doom Blades, two Freak is Cures. Some substantial upgrades that Chang gets to make in this matchup. 
I think he's probably going to want to cut things like Thoughtseize and Underworld connections. The Duress is not great in this matchup. And just become a removal deck. And he has the tools to do it here. A lot of hate in the sideboard for this kind of matchup. Somebody doesn't want to lose to Rabble Red. Yeah, he's that got... For sure. I appreciate it. You know, these black decks, I feel like they oftentimes skim too much on removal here. Chang showing a lot of respect for the deck. I'm pretty sure these sideboard slots were not here with mono white aggro in mind, but a lot of these cards are going to do double duty. Got a frontline medic, a deicide, two copies of Celestial Flare, three Brahma's King of Arescos, an additional on Johnny Steadfast, three Elspeth Sun's Champion, two copies of Dictate of Heliod, and two Hushwing Griff. So going further up the curve is, is high like after sideboard if he'd like to. Uh, I do like the additional copy of Frontline Medic because I think you just want a high density of creatures in your deck. So I think you could also make an argument for bringing in more copies of Brahma's here as well. Yeah, I don't like the Planeswalkers very much in the matchup. It, they're only good once you have a board, and Chang's whole game plan is bringing that up. I think Hushwing Griff might be good in this matchup too. Okay. Stops Light Bane Zombie and Grey Merchant. That's true. Okay, I can see I mean, that. It, you know, I, I think it's probably more for the mono blue matchup, but uh, if you want to be more threat dense anyway, which I think he does in this matchup, I think all the spells are bad, to, sure. to be frank. Even Bright of the Elements, I'm not a huge fan of in this matchup, and I just want more creatures if I'm in Justin's seat, because you've got to slog through, you know, post board Chan could have up to 15, 16 removal spells alongside Lifebane Zombie. You just need more stuff. So. Even if Hushwing Griff is kind of a borderline card anyway, the fact that it's a creature in a matchup where I want to be removing spells means I think it should go in the deck. Well, let's talk 2015 for a moment. As we know, players are racing here in Season 4 to qualify for our Players' Championship, but we did announce Quarter 1 for 2015, so this is where we're going. You see the dates associated with the city. It's Columbus, so where we'll start. We'll go to Philly after that, so an early trip to the Reading Terminal Market. Hopefully. Which, yeah, which makes me happy. Uh, we'll go to D.C., which we were just, uh, Jerry and I were there just a little bit ago, and that was a fantastic stay. Got to see a bunch of players I haven't seen for a while there. And then Indy, where we got stuck at the beginning of last year. It's going to be a cold January. These it are, will be. These are not four cities known for being hospitable during the winter months. Uh, I, I know people do have a complaint that we don't come to the West Coast all that much, and Star City, of course, is located in Virginia. Well, we'll take the brunt of that yeah. in January, as we'll be on the East Coast quite a bit. See the next row of schedule here. Houston is where we'll go in February. It's a little bit warmer there. L.A., even warmer still. Baltimore, it'll be a bit nibbly when yep. we do go there at the beginning of February. And then Miami, well, it should be a delight. Grand Prix Miami and the Open Series coming to Houston, Texas for the first time. Yeah, so that should be a lot of fun as well. I think we finish up there in Dallas, which should be pretty warm, and then Richmond, which will, at that point in the year, will probably be pretty warm as well. Not not cold, but warm not it. warm. Brisk. Yeah, that's fine. We'll have to wear a windbreaker or something like that, but that'll be our, where our first invitational is, and, and our invitational dates and cities have been announced as well. Uh, we'll be going to Richmond. We'll be going to the same other ones that we went to this year, too. Columbus, Jersey, and then Seattle. You wear windbreakers? I've been known to wear windbreaker. And you call me the old man. Windbreaker <laughs> is my father's term, by the way. Yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't call them that, really. I mean, I, I suppose I just did, but uh, on, on occasion, not very often. Typically, I wear hoodies, but I do I do own a windbreaker or two. Doing some shopping out of the L.L. Bean catalog, are you? Don't judge me. <laughs> it's actually out of the Sky Mall on my airplanes. <laughs> I like to pay the most for my products I possibly yeah. can. What are you passionate about? Paying maximum for shipping. Yep. That's my major passion that's in life. My big, that's what I love to do. <laughs> I often frequent the Brookstone as well. Oh, here's, a, oh. here's a thought, Seize. You are a salesman's best friend. I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> a Plains, two copies of Mutavault, a Soldier of the Pantheon, a Judge's Familiar, and a Johnny, and then a Precinct Captain. So a very good hand, I think, here for Justin. He just needs another Plains. Yeah, and this, hand, and, and this hand can even be functional even if he doesn't find a Plains for a while, assuming that he finds enough white one-drops to cast and just kind of be activating his mutables for a while. It looks, you know, kind of like a strange hand, right? Because he can't cast two of the cards at this point, but Mutavault is so powerful against Mono Black Devotion, I think you have to keep this hand. Oh, this is, there's no way this is Mulligan. The ceiling on this hand's very high, and the hand's functional even if Justin misses double white for a while. Plus, you're on the draw, so you have to keep. Okay, I guess that's not true, but here's yeah. the Soldier of the Pantheon. You saw a replacement judge is familiar. Implied eight card hands. So. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> He's basically kept eight. Yeah. Mutavault. Is it time for the rat? It's a Doomblade. I, like, I, I like that play a lot. I know got, you're going to say the same. Yeah, got to main face the removal spell against yep. the Brave the Elements deck. There's Judge's Familiar. Kick it back over to Lynn. See what Lynn can find here on the third turn of the game. Copy of Devour Flesh, more removal. I do wonder if Justin would have interest in sacrificing a Mutavault in this sort of situation. Another discard spell. There's a thought sees. Good draw here for Chang. You see 
another muta ball. So the judges, the draws thus far for Justin have been another muta ball and another judge is familiar. Mm -hmm. So he's actually fine with this thoughtsies because, you know, he's probably just going to be activating muta balls for a while anyway. Yep. Not giving away any information. No real new cards here. There goes the Ajani. The fact that he's taking a Johnny is a good sign for Justin here. It means that Justin, uh, sorry, Chang rather, is not flushed with removal spells. Muta Vault's going to come down. And yeah, we'll fire into the red zone. Let's see if Flynn has any interest in maybe trying to trade a Muta Vault of his own with one of Justin's. And we've been discussing Justin's mana, color mana issues thus far, but Chang definitely struggling himself. Yep. Replacement judge is familiar. It's not pretty, but it gets the job done. A swamp the draw. Against a deck that's all about trading one for one, it almost doesn't matter. As long as you can cast your stuff, the quality does not matter as much as the quantity against Black Devotion. See, Lynn's down to 13. High leg at 20. Devour Flesh, Grey Merchant, and a Drown and Sorrow. Trying to pick the best spot for Drown and Sorrow for sure. Yeah, this board's a, maybe a little too anemic for him to want to fire this off. Feels like he may get more, but the problem is he may be forced to block with the Muta Vault soon. And if he does that, he starts losing his lands, then he can't pay the Judge's Familiar tax on the Drown and Sorrow. So uh, Chang getting squeezed a little bit here. He's not taking that much damage, but so far, this is pretty awkward. Muta Vault gets fired up. Devour Flesh is going to target Justin. I think it's pretty easy just to sacrifice the Judge's Familiar to that. I think Muta Vault is too important. Well, he could animate the Muta Vault that's not attacking. Yes, absolutely. I just think that Mutavolt is one of your best cards against black, that you just don't want to sacrifice those. You can just sacrifice kind of a boring flying creature. For sure. Judge is familiar. He could get fancy here if he wanted to. There's a third Mutavolt. And now it's an Imposing Sovereign, which was the draw for the turn. So Hylic will pass the turn back over to Lynn. Gray Merchant the draw. And it looks like now will be the time to cast the Drown in Sorrow. And so that's going to clear up some creatures here. And Lynn will pay the one. So John Sarr will resolve. It's time to scry. But you know, all told, given that that's Chang's ace in the hole in the matchup, Justin's doing okay. Yep. Hushwing Griff was the draw. And I'm kind of with you now, especially because I know Chang's hand, which is he has two copies of Grey Merchant. Hushwing Griff is very, very good. Yeah. I don't mind, though. It's hard. It's really hard to justify saying go there. Yeah. I'm totally fine with, with, with Justin getting in that attack this turn, even though it doesn't look great now. Yeah, Grey Merchant's going to block the road in a big way now, too. Now, the upshot of this is now Justin probably gets to say go because he can't attack. Precinct Captain has gotten significantly worse on this board, too. Yeah, I think Justin should just say go here because playing the Precinct Captain adds very little, and there is a shot that you get hit with Lifebane Zombie or another Grey Merchant in the spot, and you're way better served griffing that. And the chances of Chang playing around Hushman Griff are basically zero. However, his draw for the turn was a mighty good one, as Pack Rat often is. Yeah. There's the Griff. So now the race is on. And this would actually be pretty interesting. Chang's very fortunate he drew Pack Rat this turn, because yes. if he just tapped out for Grey Merchant, and Justin hits him with a Griff, then he's close to dying, and Justin has all the momentum. I believe that Banishing Light was the draw for the turn, two of those in the main deck for Justin. It's very tempting to just Banishing Light the Grey Merchant and try to race, but that is a risky proposition as well. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like that line. You got to free up these Muta Vaults, yeah. I feel like. At least get in one hit, too. You get, you're not chained down to four, and then all you got to do is hang out for two turns. It's tough. If you like the Grey Merchant, you fire up a Muta Vault, you attack, Chain can discard his card in his hand to make a Pack Rat, and then you kill one of them with a Muta Vault. I just don't think getting the Pack Rat in this spot is acceptable. Just Chain just goes, all right, make a Pack Rat, and you're in the same spot, except you're down two points. Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think that you kill the Grey Merchant, you activate Muta Vault, you attack, and you force Chain to basically discard his card to kill your Muta Vault. Yeah. I think that's what you do. I mean, that, I think that's what I would do if I was in Justin's spot. I think that's the play he's going to make, which is I'm going to attack you, and this, you know, this Muta Vault's going to die, presumably. 
you know, if Chang makes this play because the Green Merchant in his hand is useless now because of the Hushwing Griff. Yeah. But Justin has the resources he has. He needs yes. to do something with these Mutaballs. This doesn't look great, but it's at least something. And what makes this good, like, is because he can never he can never make this attack, you know, the next turns because there are two Muta Vaults out there for Chang. Yeah. So at no point are the pack rats ever going to be, you know, this small again. And more importantly, this actually slows down, you know, Chang from just going, all right, like, activate pack rat, fire my two Muta Vaults, attack you the next turn the other way. And then, you know, pack rat doesn't take long to close. We all know that by now. Though, you know, J Justin's now, though, knocking Chang down to six here. He's in a spot where Chang needs to draw very well to... You know, he needs to find a removal spell in his top three cards, assuming that Justin finds no help. Yeah, because he's got enough chump blockers probably to stay alive. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, very close race. And and Chen can't get too aggressive himself here because he's very low on life. Yep. So he needs to play very defensive, air on the side of caution. That's going to give Justin more opportunities to get him with the Griff or maybe draw something significant to finish off the game. Now, of course, Chen's worst draw in the situation will just be another pack grab. That's as bad as it gets. That's a good draw. That's a hero's downfall to kill the flyer. And that's what he needed to draw. And to be fair, in this situation for Chang, he's got a lot of removal in his deck after sideboard. Yeah, I mean, his deck is almost something but removal. But this is a great setup for Chang now because these Muta Vaults can't really attack. I mean, Chang can block and just animate his two Muta Vaults. Yeah. Looks like he's just going to take the more conservative approach and just do that, which is just throw, I don't want to say throw Muta Vault away, but just trade. But that Muta Vault's really significant for, for Chang to lose there. Yeah, I mean, for the clock and everything. Highly going to draw a card. Looks like a copy of Banishing Light. That's fine, too. I mean, you're just kind of setting the tempo off at this point. Yep. Banishing Light's actually pretty good, too. Because you target this. Chang's got one card in his hand, so if he wants to make another pack right, he can do that. But Precinct Captain beats that in combat. Yeah. So Chang gets either Chump Block here or... Yeah, you get a 1-1 token. Soldier, yeah. yeah. You're probably okay with that. Go to four, trigger, get a soldier token. Not bad, not bad. Still Go. working away. Going to four is also significant here because now it means that uh, a Johnny is a lethal draw. Yeah, the... Um, Flying double strike. Yeah, call of the pride. So this is a risky one. With the Mutavolt out there, that's very risky. Yeah, he's got to have... He's got to have something to play over the top of this or he's just losing both of his creatures. Yeah, discard here. And I think that, you know, there's no really tricking Chang here. He's such he's at such a low life total, and you're not, you're not bluffing. Right. It's like either you have or you don't because he has to block. And so I think he's going to say, yeah, activate my Mutavolt, make my rats into three threes, and both of Justin's creatures are going to go in the, in the graveyard. I... Do not like that attack. Yeah, and now, I mean, Justin's uh, Justin's going to be dead very shortly. Yeah. And now Ajani Caller Pride is not a draw anymore. Yeah, see, the, the, the problem with that attack, I think, from Justin's side is that's not the situation where you can bluff and your opponent's going to play around something. Chang can't play around anything. He's a four. He's not like, it's not like he's a ten and he can outthink himself. He's like, well, I probably have to block, right? Yeah, I'm he's basically dead. dead. And if you have a trick, well, presumably it's like a pump spell, which would kill me too. Yeah. So... He's priced into blocking at that point, and that's why Justin's creatures go to the graveyard in that situation. And now Pack Rat is gnawing away at this game, and I believe this is going to be Chang's game to win, and it will be as Justin's going to concede the game. So Chang Lin is going to tie things up here. Mono Black Devotion and Mono White Aggro are going to go to a third game. Now, if, if Justin you know, misses uh, his next draws there, it doesn't really matter anyway. He's drawing very lean there, basically just to call our pride, but still, that attack, Cedric, you're exactly right. Chang's in a spot where it doesn't even matter if Justin has it, whatever hypothetical card. Chang has to block no matter what. So Justin gets called there and loses everything. Yeah, both players are going to sideboard up here for game number three. Again, an attack looks pretty bad at that point. I, mean, I, I know what Justin was going for, and we'll see what happens in game number three here. As they do get ready for game three, we will show you guys the Players' Championship format. If you missed it last weekend, you can definitely check it out right now. The 2014 StarCityGames.com Players Championship is destined to be a spectacular weekend of magic. 16 top Open Series competitors will battle December 20th and 21st for $50,000 in prizes with SCG Live bringing you all the action. For this special tournament, we've created an equally special structure. Here's how it works. We begin by splitting our competitors into four groups of four. Each group begins with an Invitational Champion, with a random drawing live on air to add a Season Points Leader and then two at-large competitors. 
The Magic kicks off Saturday morning with three matches of standard as each player faces all the others in their group in a round robin fashion. There are no draws allowed, just wins and losses. When that's done, we'll look at the standings. First place in each group goes straight to day two and the top eight. Second place gets to relax for a round. Third and fourth place face opponents from other groups in a single elimination showdown. Win and they go on, losing they're out. The elimination survivors and the second place group finishers are randomly regrouped and break out their legacy decks for some high stakes double elimination action. A win in the first round gets you a win and in for top eight, while in the second round a loss puts you into a do or die match against another 0-1. The third round of Legacy play will pit the remaining 1-1 one one players against each other in an all-or-nothing match for Day 2. On Sunday, the top eight players return for more Legacy action. Another random draw will sort them into two groups and they'll play round robin once more. First place in each group advances to the top four, but this time last place is out. Second place and third place will play across groups to determine the last spots in the top four. When the top four is set, one last random drawing seeds the bracket. The last three matches of the Players' Championship will be standard format, best of five, single elimination. The last competitor standing wins the Players' Championship and the $20,000 first place prize. Tune in to SDG Live for the 2014 StarCityGames.com Players' Championship, December 20th and 21st. 16 competitors, $50,000, two days of magic and one historic event. We'll see you there. December 20th and 21st, it's gonna be awesome. You can't wait. No. And we added two awesome players to that, and Joe Lissette and Reed Duke. Six of the tickets punched, 10 more to go. It's one of those things, you know, we've had a pretty good sense of who was going to take the point invite each time. Yeah, yeah. There is some, you know, possibility for other people to catch up. Yep. We've done really well for ourselves with the invitational slots that have been doled out thus far. I agree. I agree. Tom, Reed, and Derek Sheets, it's pretty healthy stuff. Yeah. It's funny, Sheets' name is probably, like, the most the one that people are most unfamiliar with. Yeah. And again, if you're not like, you know, someone who follows a lot of results or not a PTQ grinder like I was in my early days in the Midwest, you probably don't know who that is. But when, when he won, you know, Zach Hill is just going like, it's about time, man. Evan Irwin. Yeah, yeah, just a lot of people know who he is from the Tennessee area. He can hold his own. Yep. And you don't win invitationals by being a slouch. Yeah. Feels yeah. too hard, so. I mean, he, he went there, no buys. Yep. You know, he's not the, definitely not the trendy pick, but... It would not surprise me at all for him to have a really nice tournament there when we do go to Roanoke at the end of the year. And trust me, I am looking forward to it. Hopefully it's not too cold. That's all I ask. <laughs> Cheng Lin going to mulligan very, very quickly. See if Justin can just swing. And you've said this so many times when we watch Mono Black. Just get low to the ground. Just got started early. Get under them. Yeah, that's it. you got to capitalize on those first couple turns where they're not doing very much. And you know the other thing, too, and I think this is actually really important to say, don't even try to play around Drown and Sorrow. More often than not, it's a mistake, too. If they have it, they have it. Most people have two cops in their sideboard at most. You're not playing against a deck that has four of those. So there's one scenario where I do play around John Sorrow. Okay. If they go turn one, nothing, turn two, nothing. That's that, That's fine. Because there's just no way you get a hand that doesn't have, like, a Doom Blade or something, you know? Yeah, with the, high, with the density of, you know, removal spells, they have a two mana, Doom Blade, Bio Blight, Devour Flesh, uh, Farika's Cure, even though Justin hasn't seen any of those yet. I agree with you 100% there. If they yeah. do nothing on one, nothing on two, it's like, okay. Yep. It looks like Chang now is looking at a hand with one Thoughtseize, five lands. Snaps it off. It's a meat of all in a scry land. Uh, you know, it's fine. There you go. That's what you need. You need a one drop. Prefer for it to be a soldier of the Pantheon, but, you know, that's, that's life. And Chang has drawn his Drown and Sar. Well, this is awkward. Here's a Thoughtseize. And I don't think Justin's hand is all that great either. It looks like he might be a little bit land heavy. There is a meat of all among those lands. Now, what Justin's considering is actually countering this Thoughtseize. Yeah, he has the option to do so. Does he want to protect his hand in this information, or would he be happier with Chang taking two and taking a card? He says, I want to counter it. And Chang doesn't mind this getting force spiked here because he drew the Drown and Sorrow. He may actually may have waited a turn if, uh, you know, he didn't draw Drown and Sorrow that turn, but he does want to make sure that the coast is as clear for that as possible. Temple looks directly to Doomblade. There's a land. Hushwing Griffith, they're ready. Would you deploy a Johnny on this board? No, because if Chang has Lifebane Zombie, you lose the game. That's true. I would All just right. say go. Yep. Because, like, getting one extra counter on a Johnny doesn't matter that that much in the scheme of things. You're probably not going ultimate with it. I did forget about Lifebane Zombie, because if the Lifebane Zombie comes down this turn and takes Hushwing Griff, it's just an absolute disaster. Yeah, so it's, it's so bad. Fortunately for Highly, that does not happen. 
not only it's not just that it's so bad, but the upside on the other side is is sort of nebulous. You get one extra counter on your Ajani, and he can't get to rest, I guess. Yeah. But that seems like a much lower set of competing concerns than just getting hit by Lightbane Zombie. Meanwhile, it's going to get activated. Hylic's going to target this. Looks like this will resolve. Now here's an attack, and this is going to be a Doom Blade. So first removal spell cast. It's good to go. Why bother doing anything? They'll just Doom Blade it. Yep. And this is another window for Life Bane Zombie to be a, just yeah. a complete disaster. It's, it's an Eiffel Spectre, and that's still pretty good. So there is the 2-3 Flyer. Looks like another land was drawn here for Hylic. Banishing Light is not shabby here. It's not terrible. You're not excited about it, but it's not terrible. Got a Banisher Priest? Yep. Oh, well, I would cast the Banisher Priest because it's not getting any better. Also, if you're planning on curving out with Hushwing Griff, then probably want to get the Banishing Priest out of your hand right now. I'm with you there. <laughs> I'm with you there. That's just good analysis. Yeah. Ajani moves up to seven. Banisher Priest now three three. Also, I mean, I'd rather just have Banishing Light for Desecration Demon. Yeah. Because you want that to be gone for good. Absolutely. Ah, yes. Rats off to you. So On turn five, no less. Just an approaching going ultimate with Ajani. Now, we know that's not good here because of the Drowned Sorrow. But it does force Chang to sit on it for the time being because of the threat of, of an ultimate Ajani. There's the rat. High leg will quickly untap and draw a card. That's another planes. There's land number five. Land number six was mutable, but that's in the graveyard already. He doesn't even have another land in his hand. Looks like he's just drawn a few too many this game. This is going up. But uh, Chang's hand's pretty weak right now. I mean, I don't think he has a removal spell for this for this Vanish Priest. Yeah, it is a little bit weaker now. The, the bigger issue at hand, I think, here is that Chang's life total is 20 starting this That turn. is a big problem. That is a big problem. But, you know, the Ajani, even if Justin doesn't go for the ultimate, he does. He is in a spot where he can say, minus it twice. That's a lot of damage. In fact, right now, that's a lethal set, assuming nothing happens in the interim. Mm -hmm. Justin trying to, you know, bluff some strength here. I'm going to activate the pack rat. Discard a swamp. Rats are 2-2s two right now. And if Chang does not threaten this Ajani, he may have to clutch this Drown in Sorrow for mm -hmm. a very long time. Take a look at the Ajani will Chang. It's cats equal to life total. Yes, sir. I've ultimated it before. I have. I lost. You conceded when I was about to ultimate it against you in that draft yeah, challenge. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about how you had it on turn three every game. Yeah. Against my three Flames of the Firebrand deck. Well, that's the turn to have it on. Yeah. Good job. How about we talk about you going, I don't know what, keeping I, seven, I, going turn one, mountain go, turn two, discard a six-mana blue creature. I, I got unlucky. <laughs> I got unlucky. How about that? We're t while we're talking about things we regret, let's, <laughs> let's bring that up. There are no regrets. My hand had two flames of the firebrand. Discard a swamp, back rat, gonna come into play. It was a good keep, Patrick. And it looks like Chang is making his push here to get this Ajani off the table, I imagine. Probably for the best. That feels like the one card he can lose to at this point. And again, the, the big issue here is that Justin had not dealt any points of damage for the duration of the game up until last turn. Yeah. Chang is able to make this play because he's on 16 life. He's got so much life to work with. He's going after a Johnny. It's like, do you want to throw away Hushwin Griff to keep that thing alive? I mean, he has the option to just get the Griff in front of a Mutavolt here. That's not the worst option. I don't hate it. Yep. That'll slow down the rats a little bit. Johnny is going to die, though. Unless, well, I, I'm actually curious on where he's attacking. Did he go after Justin? It looks like he did. He's trying to induce this ultimate. If I'm Justin, the, the flags are going off. Like, something's going on right now. There's no... 
Yeah, I would be. Th I would be thinking this. I would be thinking the exact same thing. Like the flags are going off. Like it doesn't even have to be Drown Star, right? It just has to be Bile Blight. Well, here's the thing now. Now with the ultimate, he can go ahead and banishing like one of the pack rats. That means if Chang untaps and drowns himself, he loses both the pack rats. That's true. And now you have a 4-4 banisher priest. I guess he has this line of play as well. This is too much. I, I don't think it's correct to play the banishing banisher priest. I think he's playing too much stuff. Yeah. I think the banishing light would have accomplished the same thing, where yep. it basically forces a drown in sorrow. I 100% agree with you there. He's emptied the hand to get rid of to get rid of the pack rat, to get rid of, you know, basically all this stuff. And I think in this situation, what he's actually playing around is Bile Blight. He's not playing around Drown Sorrow. Yeah, but in the event that he has Bile Blight, it's, you know, there's no real cost at the end of the day. Sure. You can just untap and banish your priest, one of the pack rats, yeah. still the same way. So I think that this play is a little bit too aggressive against Drown and Sorrow, which is the card that should be number one on Justin's radar right I, now. I agree with that. Now that said, this is still this is still pretty solid. I mean, he's in a favorable position. My problem, like, is if he had a backup banisher priest, I would feel much better about his positioning because now he just has one four four, and he has to hope that the all removal spell deck doesn't draw a removal spell. Yeah, or a creature. Yeah, you know the creatures matter a lot in this spot too. Now, to Justin's credit, he gets a draw step every turn too, and he drew a spell, and it's a very good one. Just the best one that he can draw in this yes. spot. <laughs> so now Chang has to draw something, or he dies immediately. And well, he drew a spell too. It's not seized. And it was a very bad one. So he's going to pass the turn back. Hylic's going to draw a card. And all of a sudden, we're looking at a lethal attack here. Because, as we know, the King of Oreskos brings a cat along with it. So that's an attack for seven. The cat token's going to make it eight. Lin is at eight, and that is going to do it. Justin Hylic is going to win this match over Chang Lin. Two games to one. And Mono, Mono White Aggro, excuse me, five and oh here in St. Louis. Exciting stuff there. Justin able to defeat a Drown and Sorrow. Uh, I don't know if. It's one of those things where it had to be the full scope of Justin's hand. I understand what was on Chang's mind right there, which was, I'm going to attack him. It's going to make going ultimate with the Johnny too juicy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to untap, drown Sorrow away, everything, and win pretty easily. But because Justin had removal spells left back in his hand, it set the whole game plan off. Yep. Because Justin could go ultimate and then put the pack rats in a position where if you do have Drown and Sorrow, you're losing your rats against my 4-4 Banisher Priest. Justin drew slightly better in the subsequent turns, and that's all it did, all, all it took. So pretty interesting stuff there. Chang definitely tried to take a line of play to induce the play that Justin made, but Justin had stuff left in the chamber that made Chang's line of play much, much worse. Yeah, I can see where he's coming from. I've had the Drown and Sorrow all game. I want to make sure I get the maximum for it. And the maximum, well, you know, that is, you know, like 20 cat tokens. Right. So 